This is the Compass Podcast, pointing us to the divine presence and work in our everyday lives. We're talking with Lisa Colon Delay in this episode about her journey of integration. It's a journey where she discovered that we are dualistic beings who are part spiritual and part material. We're both and, and recognizing that opens us up to utilizing spiritual practices that impact our physical states as well as physical practices that impact our spiritual health. Did that trigger some ideas or reactions for you? We're going to explore together how contemplative practices specifically will impact our lived experience in the physical world. Let's find out how spiritual practice helps us deal with internal hurts, helps us in the struggle for justice, and helps us stay grounded in our physical selves with Lisa Cologne Delay. We're talking with Lisa Cologne Delay, who is an author specializing in teaching spiritual growth, healing, and transformation, as well as a weekly broadcaster on the Spark My Muse podcast and on live stream events. Lisa also provides spiritual companionship. And Lisa, we're talking about your book, The Wild Land Within, which focuses on spiritual formation and the landscape of the heart. And I love this line, and a disruption of white-centered solutions, because we love to cause holy disruptions on this podcast. <laughs> um, but in looking at your bio, one of the things that sticks out is that, that word spiritual companionship. What is a spiritual companion? Yeah, that's a great question. Sometimes pe people use the word spiritual director, and I actually okay. prefer companion because uh, director is a little bit of a misnomer. A companion, if you think about a person trained to be a friend, to walk alongside you, but without all the baggage that a friend or a family member might have, uh, where they have some real stake in the game, some emotional stake in the game. And this is a person to just walk alongside you during the ups and downs that is trained to listen and trained to ask good questions and making a, a space for the Holy Spirit to work. So a lot of times spiritual companions will just ask good questions so that you can discover for yourself um, with the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, making room for where do you see God in this circumstance or in your life right now. And oftentimes it's also paired with using spiritual practices to kind of pull from more inner resources, if you will, um, where God is moving and to align with God's will and to feel often feel comforted by the spirit. If someone feels disconnected or um, it, it really helps to kind of create a safe space and a nurturing space to feel loved and held by God and not in always a crisis. So I should say that um, it's not therapy. It's not counseling. It's not based in pathology or problem solving and problems. This is just in the good and the bad. And if a spiritual director or a friend or companion senses that there's trauma involved in healing and therapies needed, they, they are supposed to refer directly to professionals trained in that those matters trauma-informed people and they're supposed to um, just again just companion and so uh, it's not a substitute at all for therapy and any kind of clinical practice but it can work alongside some of those things um, where sometimes people in our lives are dear friends but maybe they're too busy sometimes or we don't live mm -hmm. in a it, with the luxuries, sometimes that people always have time to walk with us with the patience needed or the listening ear needed. And this person is completely um, dedicated for that hour or so, maybe once a month to be completely open and ready and the whole time is yours. And what are some of the circumstances in which people are reaching out to you? Are there, I, you mentioned that trauma is not the, necessarily the right case. Are, are they coming from different spaces which are looking for spiritual companionship? I find that it's almost always um, a kind of crossroads period in life. Could be a stage change from going from college to career or um, an empty nest uh, your, your children are finally leaving now what do you do you've had <laughs> you've had all this time with your kids and now it's your own time or maybe um, something's happened like a divorce or a miscarriage sometimes it's, it's just these crossroad periods that we all encounter for different reasons and I find that sometimes people need to 
kind of take an inventory of their life and their inner world. Sometimes it is sort of trauma related, but it's not something, it's something that they might want to process through with a, with a friend situation, but they might be already working on the therapy part with someone else, but they want to just kind of process through the spiritual part with someone who is more trained than a friend. Gotcha. Okay. On the, the wild land within, you go into process quite a bit, and I would love to kind of get your story in terms of how you came to really embracing spiritual formation through contemplative practice. But first, I feel like we need to set the table a little bit in talking about um, the idea of dualism, which you bring up very early in the book. Uh, you ground quite a bit of the spiritual formation and contemplative practice in being a means for overcoming dualism. So uh, can you describe for us what, what dualism is and why it actually might be unhelpful or harmful? Yeah, I think dualism is a word that kind of gets thrown around and, and people, especially in more maybe conservative or evangelical circles might think like, what is that? Is that like a Buddhist thing? Is that, is that having mm. to do with yoga or who knows? You know, um, I think it generally refers to this notion uh, that's also kind of a full on paradigm that influences our society's actions and even our laws and even our courtrooms and it assumes that the mind and the body are separate uh, and we i just kind of act that way it's a it's a complete like physical fallacy we don't operate in life that way at all in fact hmm. and it's a very incomplete picture um more and more evidence is coming out through science and fmris uh, learning about neurons, that we are, of course, whole organisms. Our neurons go into all kinds of places in our body. Our, our gut is our second brain. Uh, our brains are kind of plastic and they adapt quickly. And our brains are our bodies. <laughs> so this idea that the brain and the body is different um, is an unhelpful structure for understanding ourselves and it keeps us separated. And there's all sorts of other false dichotomies, what a child would ca characterize as dualistic, that there's these kind of um, spiritual physical, like it, this physical is derivative of the spiritual. And we know this now from um, physics and quantum physics. And, and we actually are knowing this in the math and science areas that are proving this out, that the people have known really for millennia and kind of ancient wisdom. But what happens in these, in these dualistic ways, and this was um, happened in, in the West and ex was just incredibly accelerated during the Enlightenment and uh, everything that's material is real and everything else is maybe just belief or you, know, you can't prove, you can't see it, you can't prove it. Um, mm. That really made things falsely um, dualistic and into dichotomies that are actually not helpful or true. Um, okay. It, it, you talked about there how the, um, I guess the spiritual can impact the physical. And I really appreciate it. At some points in the book, you, you like give the scientific description. So for example, <laughs> when talking about mantras, it, you were noting like, Hey, the sound impacts this specific nerve and right, that right. is wrapped around the spine and it helps yeah. unwind the whole body. And, uh, so there is this spiritual practice that, um, of course, is informing us in a spiritual way, but is also impacting us in, in a very physical way. So what brought you to the place where you were curious about <laughs> things like dualism and then consequentially spiritual formation and contemplative practice? Yeah, I, you know, like I think I've mentioned before, I'm, I'm just a nerd. I love neuroscience. <laughs> I also have a son with a neurodivergent brain and he has autism and I've just dug into neuroscience and I love knowing about how actually the brain works and is the mind the brain or is the mind part mm. of consciousness, which is actually more fundamental reality than our physical and material world, which is, this is where I'm kind of going into in my nerdiness, but yes, but I love what, <laughs> what actually drew me to contemplative practice was that I, not so much dualism, not so much this interest in dualism, but I was exhausted from my Christian background and I was a pastor's kid. So I was from the crib, you know, I, I was praying as a little tiny girl, you know, um, I was never not exposed to spiritual things. So I, I had this affinity for this right away, but it was also extremely about doing instead of being, and it was prayer was about talking to God and kind of this combination lock to maybe get God to do what you might want. God to do. And so when I was exposed to some 
of these more contemplative writers in the Catholic tradition at first just course just white male clerics and that's why I wanted to write this book about more than just that tiny section of people in the world I was exposed to this kind of way of resting in God and God's presence and the contemplative practices are not based in words and concepts and images and doctrine and dogma they're just about experiencing the presence of God and being found in God waiting on God I found it so restful and I really needed a rest felt exhausted and burned out and that I couldn't do enough to be um, I mean this was a this was a trick of my mind not understanding God that God wanted me to perform and perform and you mm-hmm. know, do a good job and be a good girl and the contemplative practices said no you can just lay down here rest and do nothing I love you just the same and I found it was like finding a spring of water in the desert places and so my soul was refreshed Later on, reading more, I was got into some of the, the dualistic stuff and then reading the differences between the Eastern, the Middle Eastern and the Eastern Christians and the Western ones. I was like, whoa, the difference is enormous. This is really interesting because it plays out then in the lives of the devoted in very different ways. Hmm. It, tell me about the difference between the Eastern and the Western a, a little bit. I, I, I kind of geeked out <laughs> on that. It was so informative because uh, it wasn't a lot that I had realized that there were kind of these, I don't want to say fundamental differences, but understanding differences between kind of a, an Eastern Orthodox understanding of the mind and the spirit and the, and what for most of us would be the Western understanding. Yeah. And we have a very Western influence being in the United States here. We have a very Western mm-hmm. influence stuff. And I'm not saying, Hey, throw that out. That's garbage. What I'm saying is add the Eastern part, because if you don't, you don't have what the Jewish mind understands, what Jesus was Jewish. Jesus wasn't mm. a Christian and he wasn't a Western Christian. So the the apostles were not of a Western modern American mind. They just, it just wasn't part of their purview at all. And so we should add that in to make sure we're um, really sort of understanding the Christian life, which is a, a way of being and a way of being like Jesus and not just knowing our, our beliefs or these thoughts or these bullet points and, and a specific doctrine. I'm not saying that's bad. It's just not primary, uh, which, which is becoming Christ-like is primary. And we can understand that through um, reading about the kingdom through the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we can understand what the kingdom of God is about by understanding the fruit of the spirit and these things uh, before we even understand all those doctrinal points, which can usually cause the fights, <laughs> usually yeah. cause the problems. And so what I noticed in the earliest, um, the earliest Christians, which were of course all in the, you know, Syria, and Egypt, and, you know, these places near and around Jerusalem to the East and, and, but not really that far West yet. These people were, praying in silence, praying in quietness. They were not always saying a lot. They were um, going out to the desert fathers and mothers decided to go out to the desert because in the, in their time period, um, Rome had become co-opted with Christianity. They had taken it on as a state religion and this church and state problem. It's been a long problem Mm -hmm. for humanity for you know, in modern times, this has been a problem when you um, attach power and, and wealth and religion together. Um, at least the devoted people were very alarmed because it stopped looking like this this way of Jesus. It started looking like a corrupt system of power. And so they fled to the desert and fled all the luxuries and the trappings and the upward mobility and career uh, prospects that they had in this new Christian empire superpower and up to half a million people were out in the desert living there in sparse conditions just trying to lead a simple devoted life and become more like christ and both men and women served as teachers and guides to people who would sometimes just visit the desert for a short time ask for prayer be taught ask for advice and then maybe just go back into their regular lives but but actually up to a half a million people just decided to live in the desert for a while. And that's an incredible part of Christian mm-hmm. history. Most Protestants are, are either very, 
you know, just a tiny bit aware of or not aware of at all. And that's a, yeah. that's a very formative part of Christianity that we could learn a lot from. Them, you know, they separated themselves in a way to remove themselves from, from busyness, but also I love that you note that it's to remove themselves from power and contemplative contemplative prayer itself is, is really a relinquishing of power, isn't it? Because it's like, yeah. I have to let go of the agenda and just spend this time. And, um, that can be a barrier for entry for a lot of people. I, I struggle with it myself that in terms of like, just giving control, like I want there to be an outcome, uh, <laughs> feed me through this time. Right. So how did you kind of start to uh, break down some of those barriers as you started to engage in contemplative practice? Was, was there like a, a training program that you went through? Um, well, I, I did take a lot of courses in seminary that had to do with with learning spiritual practices and, and stuff like that. But I would say that probably we're coming at it from a little bit different because I was sort of coming from a place of sort of exhaustion and burnout. And mm. I felt like I needed something and my walls were sort of broken down and um, mm. where I would I would say that it's not that I didn't have ego and pride and faulty puffed up images of myself. I'm sure I did like hubris like anybody else <laughs> and delusion, you know? Um, so I did have to break through the idea of, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm smart enough, you know, I'll, I'll be more impressive and you know, all these, all these silly little trappings that we have uh, in the spiritual life. Sometimes I think what, what did it for me really was just kind of like the place that some people come to when they're, that are addicted. And in my case, it was sort of like addicted to performance of not even religion, but just kind of like, oh, I hope I can just be very impressive before God. I want God to love me. Mm -hmm. I want to be accepted. I, I, and that is so exhausting. <laughs> so I was at kind of, I felt like at my wits end and uh, in certain respects. And so I felt like coming back to God as a child with nothing to give, with just empty, and some people, um, you know, when, when Jesus says, come like a child, I felt like I was, I was doing that not even on purpose. It was just where I was. Um, and for people who aren't really at that point, it might be something that is a little harder to work through. Um, they might, it might be more, there might be more barriers and things like that. And so, you know, contemplative practices and putting yourself in a place where, you feel like you're surrendered, you know, it could be a bit by bit sort of thing, but I, I don't think it's, it's not, it's not really something to be afraid of. You're not really, mm. you're not really losing anything. It, it's so refreshing that you, I don't think you feel uh, this giant loss or something like that. Yeah. So what if I try it and nothing happens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I, and I'm glad you asked this, this question because we are really, uh, we want to be entertained, right? We, we're consumers and we <laughs> yeah. want to be entertained. Uh, please let this be an experience that's worthwhile. And why did I put all this time into it? And I think we do have to disabuse ourselves of that in the first place. But um, the idea that, you know, I hope God shows up in this felt way, or maybe it didn't mean anything, or maybe it wasn't good for anything. And sometimes this ministry of, of the inner life that the Holy Spirit does isn't, you know, isn't this loud and noticeable thing. And I think people will also forget even when they pray that silence is also a language. Silence is also an answer. God does speak in silence. And mm. we should just kind of reframe this communication differently. But in, in terms of someone trying a new practice and it doesn't work, air quotes, doesn't work, or you don't feel anything, you know, yeah. you can keep, you can keep at it. But I usually say that to people that I wind up working with or walking alongside a little bit is that start with a practice that you already naturally have an affinity for that already means something to you, um, that already connects with you. Don't go for something like that seems really spiritual that you're not sure you can like, I think I'll fast for a week. <laughs> If you think that <laughs> that sucks already, <laughs> don't do yeah. it. Yeah, at least don't do it yet. You know, work work up to something that you know. Start with the start with the, the things you would like the most. If you think of it as just a relationship with God, and comparing that to a relationship with a person, if you think that 
um, you know, going to uh, I don't know a hardware store with a person would be boring, but going to a meal with a person would be exciting. We'll do the meal, you know, <laughs> and and it's mm. kind of I feel like that's kind of we're talking about building an intimacy with a being that can respond to us, a, a being that wants to uh, let us know, <clears throat> pardon me, let us know that it knows us, that he, she knows us. And this is a, a dynamic relationship. And we should consider that, that God wants us to enjoy the relationship. And so it doesn't have to, we don't have to slog along, right? So I just expect that every experience will be different each time, just like it is hmm. with our friends. So we go out with our friends. Sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes it's kind of a bummer. Sometimes it's yeah. a little boring. Sometimes it's, you know, super exciting and who knows, you know, we're just kind of, we don't know. And we will often just in our heads think of God as the static, like, but this wasn't fun. Like, did I do it wrong? Is something wrong? And I don't know if that's really, you know, maybe that's a little juvenile of us to think that God is sort of like a, you know, a magician or a genie that kind of will just, you just got to rub the lamp the right way and you'll get the thing you mm. want, and, you know? Yeah. So, well, I'm yeah. glad that you noted that because it so often we can think, oh, I'm doing it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe we just need to give ourselves permission to admit that uh, it, it's not wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> How we're doing it is not wrong. It's adapted and yeah. uh, and there's space for, for growth in that. Oh. Yeah. And there can be, I want to say too, that spiritual practices, I believe, have different seasons, just like we're organic and, you know, the trees are organic and they'll have different seasons. They'll need different things at different times and we'll need th different things at different times spiritually speaking spiritual practice speaking what what might be really a great fit for you in one season might really kind of not work out in another season that's not a that's not shameful that's just seems perfectly normal to me so i i like to get people moving away from thinking oh i did it wrong or this went badly and just be like, just whatever happens, just receive it as a gift. Even if nothing happens, like if nothing happens, you're like, okay, nothing happened. I'm just going to make a note. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing hmm. is sort of something and not think of it also as like you're moving like in some linear way to somewhere because again, we mm. don't really know. You have to be ready for some surprises and sometimes the surprises are that nothing happened even, you know, so we're just kind of building this intimacy with God. We're not, um, one of the things that drives me crazy with, with sometimes leaders or they will be thinking, how do I appear before people instead of how do I appear before God? Who am I to God? And in, mm. but in my own mind, like not, we know how God sees us, but who am I to God to me? And that's because that relationship is a pleasure is um, and it doesn't happen overnight. It happens through the regular intimacy and not that you won't have your ups and downs. You know, you'll have these dry periods. You'll have these spats <laughs> even, <laughs> but that's part of it. That's also part of it. And so I want to you know, make people realize that this, this relationship that we, we delve into with the Holy one, with the source is pretty comparable to our other relationships with conscious agents. It's just well, more intense, maybe. <laughs> in recognizing that there are seasons to these practices, what's a practice that you were um, kind of first adopted and what's a practice that you're leaning into now? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> Well, I think I, one of the ones that made the most profound impact on me that was new to me was Lexio Divina. The, um, I don't know if you've talked about, I think you probably talked about this on your program before, but it's, it's reading scripture and there's four movements to it where you first read the scripture, then you meditate on a piece of it that, that stands out to you, that has some meaning to you. And then you pray with that scripture to God, and then you end in a kind of restful, waiting and as you're praying you sort of leave more space between your words and your prayers and you kind of let that space enlarge until you're just in a place of waiting and kind of the bosom of god just it's supposed to be 
peaceful and <laughs> it's supposed to be enjoyable. And for me, starting off with the scripture, which is where in my in my tradition growing up, everything was about the scripture. Everything was there. It was like almost mm. like a fourth person of the Trinity <laughs> or something. Mm. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, but it was so important and I memorized so much of it and I hold it in such high regard. I love starting there and I still do. And it was that grounding and then it was it could kind of unfold from there and kind of be really devotional and personal and intimate. And then also leave me with not a sense of, okay, like I have to do something. I have to, I have to action it has to be action oriented. I could just be like, Oh, I could just let this soak in and rest. And it, and for me, that was kind of like a, a, a quantum leap or something in my spiritual understanding that God wants, God enjoys when I enjoy something, God enjoys when I have pleasure in the things of God and I can just rest. And that's, that, you know, is a good thing. And so Lexia Divina made a huge, huge impact on me. And I did this whole nine week study where I did it every single day and I recorded everything. This was for, this was for a paper, but I, I could tell too, that it, it kind of got boring. And there was a part where it got boring and dull and did nothing. It kind of, went back into a more mature sort of phase and I I still I don't do it every day by any means but I it's a really regular part of spiritual practice for me and I, I do really deeply enjoy it and I'd say the the one that I I'll actually give you two silence is the one that's has been very hard but maybe the most nourishing mm. real okay. silence internal the internal kind which is very very difficult <laughs> If you're not used to it, it's like really building a muscle because your brain is always chattering and coming in with incoming thoughts. And if those can ever settle down, which in my experience takes quite a bit of practice, then you really can almost operate on a sort of a different level, at least for, mm. <laughs> at least for a short period of time. And, um, and then the final one I'll mention, which I find extremely challenging when I'm in uh, stressful times, is called the welcoming prayer. And... That is a prayer of like total relinquishment and surrender. And mm. I find that incredibly, incredibly challenging to do and mean it. <laughs> you know, I'm maybe not that advanced and um, happily admit that, but I, I find that the welcoming prayer is one of the most um, dynamic calls to us to say, thy will be done. Everything's okay. It's in your hands. I give it freely. I give everything freely to you. And um, I'm very inspired by it, but I'm, I'm nowhere near a full commitment. You know, in all honesty, I'm nowhere near a full commitment when I'm at my most trying times. Or if there's some kind of personal, uh, interpersonal issue, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to hang on. To that. I'm going to try to fix that. <laughs> you know, I really feel vested in fixing myself. Can you, um, can you give us a little bit of an outline of what the welcoming prayer looks like for you? Yeah, let me actually I'm going to try to go to the page um, I, where I have this in the book. And this was, um, I had read this about this before, but as I was working on the book, I wanted to include it. And so then I delved more deeply into the history. And it wasn't from, typically you hear that this is from Father Keating, Thomas Keating, but actually he, it wasn't. It was from Mary Markovitz, I think is her name. This is where you're going to have to edit. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, like, it, it's a very, it's, it's like Mary Mrazowski. Mrazowski. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and she was this force, sounds like a force of nature. And she, <laughs> through her, through her teaching, through her, um, I guess just listening intently and, and sucking up what um, Thomas Keating was talking about. And then she was part of this, like a, it was like an intentional community. She came up with the welcoming prayer, which is essentially a surrender. Now, okay. it's really first you you take an inventory of all the commotions and the sensations in your body. So it's really something that you would use. And again, I would say this would need a lot of practice to, to do it well. So say something kind of horrible happens. And at first, you, you need the presence of mind and the practice, I believe, to be able to reflect and take kind of an inventory of what's happening bodily. What we tend to do in trauma is we do separate. We, like, 
for the sake of self-preservation, we sort of separate ourselves from our body in a sense, and we kind of go into our brain. And um, so this is kind of tr purposely reintegrating, saying, what am I feeling? Like, am I feeling a tension in my chest? Am I holding my breath? Am I squeezing my toes together? You know, what are all the commotions and the sensations in my body and the thoughts and emotions? I'm just kind of assessing that right away. That takes a quite a a great deal of presence of mind if you're going through something really, really challenging. And you might not be able to do that right then. You might have to wait a little bit um, and reflect a little later. But Mary was able to do this when she was hit by a car and pinned to a wall. And she was able to do this prayer and just enact it. And, and everyone was horrified because she she shattered both of her legs as she was pinned to this wall. And she she said, uh, in everybody's presence, she said, I welcome the pain. I, I, I welcome, not that she was saying, yes, good pain, but she was saying, I'm not going to try to pretend what's happening isn't happening. I'm not going to split off. I'm not going to try to escape it. She's like, I, whatever is here, it is here. And I accept it. It's like a prayer of accepting reality as it is. A few of us dare to do that. You know, that's, that's mm. what's so sort of stunning we love fantasy escapism we um because then we in some way choose to keep it our will and our to ourselves and this way is kind of like it it is exactly as it is lord i give it to you i'm not going to fight it i it everything is yours and so um so at that point you say different sort of welcoming statements that pertain to what you're going through and you bring your thinking mind down into your heart and your body. So you're kind of keeping those things together and integrated. And um, she would say, like, this is a general one. I welcome what is. I let go of the desire for certainty, for security, for affection, for control. I let go of my desire to change the situation. And that doesn't mean you're passive and you will just take injury. But the the desire to control the situation is that kind of my will over your will, Lord. So it's it's a just a kind of a, a relinquishment of our will, which is to say, thy will be done. It's a different way of saying thy will be done, but it kind of involves our whole organism, our whole self, which is quite, <laughs> that is really, really high level spiritual stuff. Yeah. Um, so which is to say, I, I don't feel like I can do it except in the tiniest ways for the tiniest things. And maybe someday I, I will get there. Um, but I admire greatly someone who can say, yes, this has happened. I don't like it, but I, uh, but it's well with my soul. Mm. That embracing of the reality, it, that can be a disruption in mindset, especially in terms of faith, because uh, a lot of times we retreat into faith as sort of a, uh, a way of escaping uh, a reality, right? Um, it, you um, you bring up contemplative practice as a as a disruption um, to the mindset that would have us escape and begin to kind of embrace our realities, and especially in the way that we look at the world around us in terms of of justice and equity and, and equality. Um, even saying that, well, this can be a, a disruption to white centered solutions. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like how, how does uh, contemplative practice disrupt that kind of mindset? Well, it, it only disrupts it if we're willing to listen to other voices and seek out other perspectives that aren't the dominant one. That's actually mm. quite hard to do because algorithms don't promote that art. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking as a, a Latina that is white presenting, um, I kind of walk in both worlds, not, I, I get all the privileges of being white. People speak poorly of Puerto Rican people in front of me and, um, and, and they don't, they don't even realize it, you know? So I will, <clears throat> I feel like I have to build these bridges where people understand about their white centric often. And I don't even think it's malicious. It's just when you're on top, when you're on the top, you don't have to think about a lot of things. That's what privilege is. And that's what also what I have. But since my dad was a dark skinned brown person, 
I could mm -hmm. see what he uh, directly see the things he went through, uh, not being the preferred looking kind of person. And that's what this breaks down to is like racism and or sexism even breaks down to what you look like, what your body parts are, what you look like, what people prefer. It's not even sophisticated. That's how silly it is, but that's really what it is. And so when we listen to, you know, if, as white people listening to white people, it's just a default. It's just what happens. So you have to seek out that other, those other voices. But when you do, you find that you get the good news. The good news comes from the margins. It always has. Jesus came from the margins. Jesus came to tell us the good news from the margins as a dispossessed poor person of color who had no status who had no money, you know, it's just, it's just how it works. And so that's why this empire influence, we have an empire kind of Christianity in the United States takes for granted that the margins are the, the people from the margins are the teachers. And so i I want to reverse that. I want to say like, um, who's, who's on your panel is, does everybody look the same? <laughs> why mm. disrupt it? Cause it's, it's an automatic tends to be an automatic thing. Unless you have leadership that's diverse, you will get the same results over and over. So you have to have people representing you. I mean, this is kind of the beauty of democracy that we don't particularly like to enact in our country, but democracy means that the voices count from all over. So we start democracy off in this country with just kind of landowners that are white <laughs> their mail mm -hmm. when we call it democracy it's like that sort of doesn't yeah. seem like democracy though are we missing some voices here a little bit so if we actually believe in the beauty of voices counting well let's make sure that they're there and so in spiritual formation and contemplative practice everything that i learned from the people like i did start learning from thomas keating henry nowen thomas merton fantastic changed my life but they're all white clerics in mm -hmm. vocational life, um, educated white males who I adore. And that's just one tiny little piece. And there's so much more. So I wanted to mm. learn like um, uh, Howard Thurman, fantastic, mystic, uh, contemplative, um, really, uh, if, if people haven't read him, especially white people and this is the thing when you ask people of color and other people, they have different reading lists and we don't yeah. bother. Mm -hmm. We don't bother saying who's someone that you love uh, recently that you've read, you know, be interested in what other people are reading that don't look like you just ask, what are some of your favorite books? Then read the books, <laughs> you know, then put them on your library and actually do it instead of um, saying, you know, don't make the other people make the book list for you, search them out yourself and actually, mm -hmm become educated uh, in a more rounded way than the, than this one tunnel vision because we're so impoverished for not having these other voices. I couldn't, I can't even tell you um, the difference it's made, but you do have to do the work because again, it's publishers tend to not, more recently it's changing, but publishers tend to publish what they think will sell, which guess what that is, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what's already been selling, right? So yeah, so we just, have to do due diligence to make sure those other um, perspectives come into our awareness and also promote them. So tell your friends, I read this fantastic thing. You need to get this book and, um, you know, promote the work of other people. Um, it's just really important. We, we've gone way too long. There's no excuse. We've gone way too long without hearing other voices. And I'm kind of here to go like, all right, let's do this. Come on. What <laughs> let's let's mix this up not in any kind of antagonistic way but just a kind of a, we're better than just listening to one tone every single time we're reading a book mm. yeah yeah jamar tisby brings up a great point and i've got my little statuette of john wesley sitting back behind me there on the video and like when john wesley does theology uh in our worldview we call that theology but when anthony the monk <laughs> the contemplative who we're yeah. building all these practices on does theology. Like we call that, Oh, that's Eastern theology, right? There's this right. sense of, of yeah. separateness. And, um, you know, maybe our goal should not be to, uh, to kind of label, uh, that as being separate. Um, but embracing that as, as part of our tradition, because, well, as you mentioned, Keating and Merton and all those, they all built on that tradition. <laughs> 
yeah yeah and they're coming they're coming from a specific place and a specific time very valuable stuff but it is specific to their position it's specific to their privilege and their access to education mm. and where they come from i mean i i love merton but i've read a few things and i thought only a guy would say that mm. <laughs> like if he ever <laughs> yeah. had if he had ever asked a woman that would never cross their mind like it, that is just so strange you know stuff like that and you'll hear this a lot of times with with pastors that are male they'll say something and it is never it, it'll be like yeah when you think da, da 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 and i thought oh my goodness if he had if he could have gone over this message with a woman first he would realize how absurd that sounds and mm. like like the horrendous mother's day <laughs> uh, sermons i've heard i, I thought um oh goodness uh. like, you just don't realize the blind spot we don't we have blind spots we all do yeah and and that's the thing is that we can't see them because they're blind spots but maybe someone else can and we are so benefited when someone can say i love you i i think you missed a little section here and then we're better off and and so i think collaboration cooperation it just it just raises all the boats and we don't have to be thinking of ourselves in competition with each other we're, we're brothers and sisters we're siblings that that are put here with different viewpoints and different gifts and abilities for a reason and it, we all benefit from them and I, I think what ha can happen is it can turn into this like competition like well if they get more time then i won't get my piece of the pie and yeah i don't i don't think of it like that at all as an author as a podcaster as um i i just think that what we're supposed to do is be working together and that's why when i um when I speak with people, I, like they're just, we're just friends. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there's no, there's no, um, their victory is also my victory. And and this is to me, the mentality that is reality. And we have to, we have to hold tightly onto this reality because when we make it something different, it, it really gets perverse. Truth, truth. <laughs> well, um, Lisa Cohen, thank you so much for spending this time with us. What is, um, what's a project that you're working on? What are you excited about next? Well, there's the, um, stuff I'm trying to do in Puerto Rico, which is there's a lot of need in Puerto Rico right now. I visited recently and 52% of the population is below the poverty line. Uh, it's a U.S. territory. It's, it's constantly getting kicked around, um, where, there's if, if stuff is made there by a company based in the United States that for instance Advil is made there so Advil can't be sold there if it's made there it has to go back to Florida or somewhere else in the mainland United States and then come back on US transportation and then there's a 20% tax import mm. tax you can imagine that happening in Florida or New York of course not <laughs> so there's a lot of <laughs> can you even imagine like Florida oranges go to New York to, to be sold in Florida and then mm. tax 20% when they come back in. I don't think they would put up with that. So there's a lot of things in Puerto Rico that are just just not right. So the uh, poverty is, is much, much higher. They import 85% of what they need because they're in this kind of, uh, they've been through the policies of the United States and the, the federal government, they've been kind of squeezed into these dependency uh, cycles that are really unhealthy and they their cost of living is 26 percent higher than it is on the mainland so you can mm. i just bought a plantain the other day it was 33 cents here it was a dollar on the island where they grow them and so mm. it's and there's a lot of things upsetting to me there and i would like to go down and help build uh, help partner with other people and and build up some of the more food sustainability and there's no recycling at all on the island so there's a lot of things that i would like to help with so i'm I have a GoFundMe that I'm working on to start things with that. And that's my main focus probably for the next year or two. I'm working on another book, but I'm I'm kind of in flux with what it's about now. So I, I might change okay. direction. So I probably won't even mention what that's about right now. Gotcha. All right. Well, that GoFundMe, we'll link up to it on our website. And it's available on your website as well. So thank you so much for spending this time with us and for, uh, you know, helping us to maybe look at through some different perspectives in the future. Appreciate it so much. Again, Lisa Colon Delay's book is The Wild Land Within. 
You can learn more about Compass and check out other episodes at umc.org slash compass. If you were into this episode, you should definitely follow it up with a listen to our episode with Tyler Sitt about how spiritual practices disrupt. It's good stuff. So glad to have this time with you. My name is Ryan Dunn. Thanks to United Methodist Communications for making this podcast possible. And I'll talk with you soon. Peace.